A very good afternoon to all of our attendees, and I welcome you to the 10th and final session of SolCon 2021. I would like to take a moment to thank all of our session attendees and organizers to make this event successful. Uh, before starting the presentation, I would like to remind that SoilCon sessions and presentations can be best viewed on the Google Chrome browser. And if you are using any other browser, you might experience technical difficulties. So I recommend you to switch to the Google Chrome if possible uh, now. And in case of any te technical difficulties you will experience throughout the session, you can always use the SoilCon support chat widget, which is located on the bottom left of screen. And once you have any question related to the presentations, they can be typed on the chat bar on the right side of the screen. And make sure do not get confused between the left versus the right bottom, uh, right side of screen chat widgets. They are different for different purposes. So with that, I welcome our first speaker, Dr. Bill Pan. He recently retired as a professor after 36 years of career in Department of Crop and Soil Sciences at Washington State University. In his talk, he will give the big picture about the soil health focusing on the Washington state. So please welcome him and presentations here. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me to present here. We've heard a lot of great seminars on soil health over the past week and also during the WC soil health webinar. Uh, but as I move into retirement after a long career in crop and soil sciences, Chris Benedict did ask me to give my career perspectives and big picture of soil health history, current and future. So let's take President Theodore Roosevelt's advice and apply it to soil health. He said, the more you know about the past, the better prepared you are for the future. And he is one of our Mount Rushmore's presidents, so I think he knows, he knew what he was talking about. I admit to being a bit of a land grant rat. My many relatives attended University of Minnesota, but my own history traces through four other land grant institutions from University of Wisconsin to Missouri and NC State for my grad programs before coming to Washington State University. I was struggling as an undergrad searching for a science discipline that really inspired me. So I was the king of introductory science courses, taking everything from the core of chemistry, math, physics, biology, to botany, geology, meteorology, astronomy, economics, and philosophy. Now, Dr. Leo Walsh was the head of the soil science department at the time, so he was my formal soils advisor. We talked in his office where he encouraged me to pursue grad school, and he was aware of my interest in both plant and soil sciences, and so he recommended that I look into soil fertility and plant nutrition programs, gave me some recommendations. So at Missouri and NC State, I had crop physiologists, crop breeders, and soil fertility specialists on my committees. Tremendous mentors, caring, and dedicated people that provided me a model for mentoring and advising my own grad students. Now, in my travels across the U.S., I experienced firsthand soil variability, much of which was created by differences in precipitation across the U.S. Uh, here's one explanation of the effects of precipitation on the buildup of organic matter, the leaching of carbonates and exchangeable basic cations, leaving acidic cations, populating the cation exchange complex, trending from Midwest to Western uh, U.S. And this trend in soil char characteristics and precipitation is mirrored over uh, the distance from eastern Washington to central Washington. And as a result, soil health metrics, as you might imagine, uh, vary across these spectrums and soil series as well. In 2019, I did a Google search for these terms 
in soil science article titles and keywords over the past 50 years to get some sense of trends and research emphasis over time. Uh, soil fertility has been a prime topic since nearly since the advent of soil science and major erosional events put soil conservation at the forefront early on as well. Soil quality started receiving attention in the 80s while soils and climate have received increasing attention since the 90s. Now, soil health initiated around the same time, but it's really taken off in the past decade and looks to be in a sustainable upward trend. Now, when I started my career in soil science, the subdisciplines of physics, chemistry, and biology were somewhat siloed. But as other speakers have indicated, soil health is an integrated soil science with increased emphasis on the breakthroughs in soil microbiology. In establishing my program, I decided to weave the history of soil fertility into the scope of uh, the nutrient cycling rhizosphere ecology program that I created. And here is what I regard as the first recognized nutrient cycle. The Chinese concept of Wu Qing uh, established sometime around 200 um, BCE. And Wu Qing, or the five elements, astutely described the interactions of water, earth, metals, and plants, and fire. And while it has had numerous applications in many facets of Chinese philosophy, the most straightforward interpretation of this concept is that it's a nutrient cycle, perhaps the first nutrient cycle ever established. And it's been such an enduring concept that uh, modern day nutrient cycles that you can pull from the web are almost mirror images. That nutrient cycle has provided the foundation for most of our work, including a rarely studied element in dryland systems, silicon. Now, a hypothesis was studied by Taylor Beard uh, related to silica. During her master's thesis, uh, she asked what is the role of soluble silica in soil crusting that we see, in, in particularly in eastern Washington, after raindrop impact. And the contrast we studied was wheat versus canola straw residues, where wheat straw silica uh, we recognized was many times higher than the silica in canola straw, uh, while canola, canola straw is higher in lignin, which is the building block of organic matter. As part of her research, Taylor added silica to soil, simulating silica recycling with re wheat residues and found crust formation to be thicker and uh, electron microscopy showed some crystals formed on the soil particles that increased with silica application rate. In these videos, Taylor and Isaac showed how surface crust can impede seedling emergence a problem in eastern Washington soils. So our hypothesis is that with long-term canola integrated into monoculture wheat, we might reduce silica cycling back to the soil su surface and reduce surface crusting. Pictured here is Harold Elmer Fulton, Washington State's first agricultural chemist. And Fulton Hall is still part of the Pullman campus today. Ful Fulton measured and recognized nutrients removed by wheat harvest 
that needed to be replaced by lime and fertilizers following the chemical principles of mass balance and mass conservation. He established these principles in the wheat cropping systems during the first, very first generation of Washington wheat farming. We made some calculations and published this table of data in our paper that culminated our REACH Regional Climate Change Project. And we used IPNI county level data to estimate the amounts of N, P, and K removed by crop harvest and supplied by fertilizers, biological end fixation, and manure across the whole inland Pacific Northwest region that we were studying. And you can see the balance is pretty good for nitrogen, uh, heavily reliant on commercial fertilizers, while P and K were de uh, being depleted over time. Over several years, Rich Koenig, Ashley Hammock, Ty McClellan, Mercer Porter, Isaac Matson, Haiying Tao, and I have conducted a lot of research on nitrogen management, nitrogen responses in uh, spring and winter canola, trying to figure out how to best balance inputs and outputs. So here are the fertilizer end trials uh, that, that we published in two publications. Um, plotted on the x-axis is total end supply, which includes estimates of non-fertilizer end supply added to our fertilizer end rates plotted by the symbols. So perusing over the trends, what, what's most striking about these fertilizer end responses? Well, the answer is that um, canola was surprisingly non-responsive to end fertilizer at several site years, both in spring and winter canola. And why is this? Uh, canola uses a lot of nitrogen. We know that uh, canola end uptake is very high. There's a lot of protein in canola grain. And uh, we so we realized that canola is a great scavenger of of residual soil nitrogen. And many of these trials occurred following fallow, supporting the notion that we are probably underestimating the amount of nitrogen mineralized um, during the fallow season and requires further follow-up with uh, more microbial and fertility trials. In contrast, Here's a more typical Mitchellick model of diminishing returns yield response to total end supply by two recropped spring wheat varieties, hard red spring wheat varieties in the 16 inch rainfall zone. So note that the soil end supply was estimated to only be about 50 pounds per acre. And note that uh, grain protein percentage uh, represented by the dotted line with the squares and also total grain end and crop end continue to rise well past the nitrogen supply level that was required to achieve optimal grain yield. So it's important to recognize that maximizing protein yield, while this is an important food security goal that might also reap some additional economic benefits for farmers. This does leave more unused nitrogen in the soil. And this nitrogen would then need to be recycled in the subsequent crop with post-harvest soil testing and the necessary adjustments in subsequent fertilizer inputs. Here are some concerns about nitrogen fertilizer use with regard to climate change. Sarah Waldo, a former PhD student, Brian Lamb and Dave Huggins 
headed up an effort to measure carbon and N2O fluxes from different cropping systems over time. And one of the things observed was that uh, N2O spikes followed rainfall and fertilizer applications, uh, as pictured here in the graphs. And in addition, it recognized that life cycle greenhouse gas emissions also trace back to fertilizer production at the fertilizer manufacturing plant. So improvements in nitrogen use efficiency need to be made through cropping system choices and through improved nitrogen fertilizer management strategies. Now, subsoils hold a critical component of soil health where soil strength porosity defines root resistance and rooting depth. And this also defines the overall water and nutrient availability to a crop, carbon storage, and microbial activity. Here's some data summarized by Isaac Madsen showing substantial micronutrient stocks uh, located below the topsoil. And so this suggests that perhaps we should be doing more routine soil testing for micronutrients in the subsoils. Presented here are various soil carbon measurements total carbon, pox C, hot and cold water extractable carbon for conventional till, no-till, and grassland systems at the Palouse Conservation Farm near Pullman. Uh, this data was collected and summarized by Catherine Nosco, um, Hying's PhD student as part of National NRCS project. And for this study, samples were taken by horizon depth down to a depth of about three feet. And you can see there are substantial carbon stocks below the top three inches that are normally sampled for soil health. So this emphasizes the importance to sample the subsoil to fully document soil carbon stocks. This was a one year snapshot of cropping systems and it supports the in-depth review of carbon stocks by Dr. Peng uh, in Dave Huggins' program. And she gave a terrific presentation in the WCU webinar. So I refer you to that presentation to get a full view of uh, what's going on across the landscape uh, with regard to carbon and um, what's going on with carbon trading. Let's now turn our attention to soil water storage, since this is such a huge soil health metric in our soils, particularly in dryland systems with our wet winters, extremely dry summers, and heavy crop reliance on stored soil moisture. There are three major checkpoints of soil water. Uh, the point of saturation, where all the air pores are filled with water, fuel capacity, uh, where the soil is allowed to freely drain its macropores and the micropores are retaining available water for plant growth. And the third is the permanent wilting point at which there is no more plant available water. Now saturated flow is driven by hydraulic pressure and facilitated by continuous macropores from wormholes large rooted crops like canola, radish cover crops, etc. This process helps facilitate water movement deep into the subsoil and available water at field capacity can be improved by organic inputs and aggregation. We've had a concerted project to integrate canola in our wheat dominated systems and one of the benefits of canola is to offer a different kind of root system into the system. Uh, the thick, deep tap root of canola, particularly winter canola, creates macropore channels for 
improved water infiltration and for the further growth of roots of subsequent crops. Uh, canola has long root hairs, much longer than wheat. And uh, so it's effective at acquiring immobile nutrients more effectively. And it also it turns out it's more acid tolerant than wheat and peas. But uh, it is recognized as being non-mycorrhizal, uh, but the root hairs do uh, make up for that. But uh, this does likely reduce mycorrhizal fungal, fungal spores during its turn in the rotation. So it's something to be further studied. Think of large tap roots and worms serving as biological aerators. Water holding capacity is also governed by soil texture, which is which sets a baseline for each soil's proportions of different sized soil particles. Uh, soil texture is a stable soil health metric. While we can't readily influence soil texture, we can manage soil organic matter, which influences water hold capacity. Here's the USDA uh, quoted impact of soil organic matter on available water. This is, of course, dependent on the soil type and the starting level of organic matter, but it is used to generally il illustrate um, how much you can improve water holding capacity with what uh, organic matter additions. On the right um, is a study published in a University of Florida Extension article uh, showing the increase in water holding available water with increases in organic matter as added in a lab experiment. Here is a list of soil physical health indicators summarized by Dr. Christine Morgan at the Soil Health Institute. These measurements include uh, penetrometer resistance, bulk density, infiltration, uh, hydraulic conductivity, plant available water, aggregate stability. Uh, she also rated them in terms of their ease of use from very easy to moderate and uh, made some statements about the transferability of the findings and relative costs. And as we heard from Kyle Bear during the uh, WSU Soil Health webinar, these costs will vary from lab to lab. Now, various soil enzyme activities and genomics are being actively researched uh, relative to nutrient cycling, carbon dynamics. Here are 10 en enzymes that were summarized in this NRCS resource recently published by Acosta Martinez. And there are some exciting new methods for describing the soil microbiota as summarized in this CS, recent CSA News article uh, featuring the QSIP method, which hopes to get at the great biodiversity of soils, which are credited for one quarter of our planet's total biodiversity. I will now focus my comments on farmland management and the need to develop win-win scenarios for farm and climate. And we wrote this 2017 Frontiers paper on the 130-year history and perspectives of soil health versus farm economic trade-offs and the future prospects toward these goals using Inland Pacific Northwest as a case study. 
and we focused on the farmer-centric decision-making process to facilitate the win-win scenarios. Without reading the fine print in this figure, it illustrates that farming decisions are complicated with multiple decisions informing inputs, variations in farm plans, personal and business goals that need to be met while addressing climate mitigation and adaptation. Now, as an example, Karen Sowers, Dennis Rowe, Frank Young, me and others learned that to achieve canola integration, pictured at the top, into uh, Eastern Washington wheat systems as part of our Washington biofuels and uh, oil seed projects that we had to address all of these farmer centric factors before addressing before achieving a 10x increase in canola acreage. So taking a more holistic approach to uh, get at what drives Far, uh, changes in farm practice. Building upon our integrated soil health diagram, we now recognize that soil health advancements not only require integrated soil science, but also integration of other disciplinary considerations, such as asking the question, well, what is the actual soil function of interest. Do you, are you focused on production, ecosystem services, etc.? Uh, what are the economics, the sociology, and policy surrounding uh, farmer and driving farmer decisions uh, in order to make real progress? I'd like to finish by talking a bit about organic amendments, which probably have the best prospects for actually rebuilding soils and soil organic matter. And worldwide, long-term experiments have confirmed consistently that the addition of organic amendments builds soil carbon and nitrogen pools. Uh, organic amendments include things like peat moss, biosolids, uh, compost, various types of manures, crop residues, and food wastes. Let's give a big shout out to Andy Berry, who is retiring from WCU after 35 years of service. I had the pleasure of working with Andy and Craig Cogger, as many have, on long-term biosolids effects. And we studied uh, soil, carbon, and nitrogen, uh, both acid hydrolyzable and non-hydrolyzable fractions of carbon and nitrogen, uh, which were shown to uh, build up, actually doubled uh, over 20 years due to varying rates of King County biosolids additions to these wheat fallow systems in Okanagan. And so they figured out an economic way to commercially transport biosolids more than 100 miles from these urban sewage treatment facilities to farm fields that badly needed the additional organic matter. This then made me wonder, what about animal manure, another rich source of organic amendments? And just as uh, a comparison, there are maybe 100, uh, two. 282,000 Washington dairy cows producing one to two times as much organic carbon and nitrogen waste as the 7.6 million Washington residents. So how can we economically push dairy manure out onto ag and forest lands as we do with the biosolids? That could be an uh, active uh, question of future research. Here's a new unique opportunity fostered by an old Husky Cougar partnership. Uh, Bill McKean and I developed back in the 1990s. The concept uh, we developed was to harvest 
excess wheat straw, reducing the need for field burning, pulping the wheat straw into cellulose fiber for paper and cardboard production, and then leaving behind a lignin-rich byproduct that could be returned to ag fields for restoring stable soil carbon, particularly for eroded areas. And as previously mentioned, lignin is recognized as a basic building block for stable soil organic matter. So this concept and research has resulted 25 years later into the very first U.S. straw pulping plant located in Starbuck, Washington, and really the only uh, pulping plant of any kind to be built in the U.S. over uh, the past decade. Here are some examples of soil microbial and physical responses to the added pulping co-product um, that was generated and published by my former PhD student, Kenming Zhao. Uh, he documented CO2 respiration, enzyme activity indicators, and aggregate size distribution and stability. And this was before we had even heard of the term soil health. Now, if you're around long enough, you will start training the offspring of your former students as well. And Yao Yi Zhao, daughter of Ken Ming, um, did a summer, summer internship with us under the REACH program and generated the great biosolids data, was co-author on the paper um, that I showed a few slides back. Now, before I sign off, I would be remiss if I didn't put in a plug for the Soil Science Society of America, our official community for our science. Along with crops and agronomy, these are three great organizations managed in tandem, and yet I was privileged to chair the only standalone meeting in its history in 2019 and presided, then presided over its reunion uh, once again as a tri-societies later that year. There was a lot of controversy over this move, but it was a great opportunity to reinvigorate and focus on our soil science while reaching out across borders. This is a photo on the lower left of uh, Mexican soil science president and vice president standing next to Tom Vilsack and me and uh, Tom Vilsack was our keynote speaker in San Diego in 2019, and he was the former Secretary of Agriculture under President Obama, and now reported to be back in the saddle with the Biden administration. And so SSA is well connected. Then we quickly hit the pandemic leading to the first ever virtual meeting in 2020. Over this span of the few years, we also had time to renew and fortify our strategic plan to recommit to diversifying our ranks, mentoring our young scientists, focusing on new frontiers and climate change challenges. So I encourage all soil scientists, whether academics or practitioners, to join if you're not already a member. And if you are a member, please consider volunteering to offer your leadership when you can. In particular, we need young voices to help guide SSSA and our science into the future. In summary, the future is in the hands of enthusiastic and bright young soil scientists like those depicted in these pictures, eager to produce a new generation of full soil profile, uh, soil health and root system data, and even a new generation of soil monoliths. So thank you for your attention, and it sounds like I'll have an opportunity to answer any questions you might have later on.
on the behalf of all the attendees, I'd like to thank Dr. Pan for his major contributions made in the issues of soil health throughout his career, and particularly in the context of this presentation on the fertilizer use efficiency and on the soil water retention capacity. Uh, before moving to our next speaker, I would like to remind everybody that questions related to these talks can be typed in the chat bar on the right side of the screen, and all these questions will be answered in a live question answer session at the end of the session. And also, I wanted to mention that in the end of this session, a poll will be prompted. And in that poll, I will highly encourage that people to uh, interact and uh, give their experiences through the poll. So with that, I would like to move to our next session speaker, uh, Jeremy Bunch. He is the Director of Research, Development and Logistics at the Shepherd Grains. And he will be discussing about the incentives to the farmer for practicing the soil health. And yeah, the next talk is live now. Good afternoon. My name is Jeremy Bunch with Shepherd's Grain, and I want to talk to you all today about this topic of, of how do we incentivize growers to adopt more sustainable, regenerative agricultural practices, and what ways can we find to help monetize and, and incentivize growers to make those kind of changes. Shepherd's Grain is a, uh, as it's written here on this slide, a proven supply chain for regenerative agriculture. And, and we've been around for quite a few years doing this. We think that we do have a model that works in, in, in that regard and uh, happy to share it with all of you. Our mission, and this is kind of a, a uh, unofficial mission statement, if you will, but it's it's really to bring sustained value back to farms based on the production system of no-till with diverse crop rotations, and you could add cover crops, livestock integration, basically regenerative agriculture there, while embracing current and new technology to produce high quality and nutritious foods. In, in, a, in a very brief nutshell, what we do is we buy wheat from 35 growers here in the Pacific Northwest and um, who, who are all committed to conservation agriculture. And then we have that wheat milled into flour and sell the flour all over the place. And so that's, that's the brand that we have, Shepherd's Grain, which is directly from, from our growers. And they are able to get kind of a niche market out of the Shepherd's Grain brand. A brief history here, Shepherd's Grain was started in 2003 by Fred Fleming and Carl Coopers, two Eastern Washington wheat farmers that uh, got together and, and wanted to start direct marketing their crops. Um, they, they just had a real desire to connect users and consumers of uh, wheat flour with the growers who produce the wheat. Basically, they had um, you know, they had lost that in many respects over the years, just that disconnection between farmers and consumers that has taken place and they wanted to remedy that. They started Shepherd's Grain to, um, to do that, but, but to have it based upon the production system of no-till and direct seeding. And, and their motivation there was they, they wanted to preserve the land for generations to come. And the idea behind sustainability here is that is, is the idea that farmland should be managed in such a way so that it can be farmed indefinitely. A good picture of unsustainability is what has gone on here in parts of Eastern Washington, North Idaho, on the Palouse, in hilly country where we've had, um, it, it's astronomical the amount of soil erosion that we've had, the amount of, of lost soil that we've had ever since we began cultivating this land. And uh, they wanted to turn that around and, and really establish a direct marketing system for their food products that they grow, but have it be based in the values of environmental sustainability. They wanted to create a supply chain that was not only based on that environmental sustainability, but also on, on economic sustainability in, in realization that those two things work together. Um, but they knew that none of it would would go anywhere the okay environmental sustainability great idea economic sustainability great idea but if you don't have the quality to go along with that story you you're, you're not going to win in the marketplace and so shepherd's grain 
uh, puts a lot of effort and research into it, ensuring that we really have the best flowers that we can possibly produce on the market. Um, regenerative supply chains that are economically sustainable is what everyone is kind of aiming for out there. But but there are just are a, a lot of, of challenges with that. Um, and so, you know, I, as, as I go to working groups or different meetings across the country, I run into all sizes of companies, big, medium, small, who are trying to figure this out. Everybody wants farmers to adopt regenerative practices but how do we get them to transition to those? And so there, there are challenges in the way. Government programs can certainly help, but that's not our focus here. In fact, Shepherd's Grain from the beginning intentionally sought to develop a program that did not rely on government solutions or subsidies at all. Um, we recognize that, that a lot of the government programs um, we're hurting progress towards more sustainable practices, whether that was direct subsidies or, or whatever. Now, there, there are certainly government programs that um, assist growers in purchasing equipment or putting land in, into sustainable management, um, and that's all good, but that's, that's not really what I'm gonna cover here. Um, I think the first and most important thing that we need to understand when, when asking this question of, of how, do we, how do we get farmers to adopt sustainable agriculture, conservation agriculture. Um, there's deep cultural forces at play, okay? Um, a, a lot of farmers just really enjoy, and, and, and not just enjoy, but they feel it deeply in their bones that they, they want to manage things the way that their father did, the way that their grandfather did. And, and so that's just really embedded in there. When you, when you talk to a grower and, and you broach the subject that maybe he's not managing his land quite as well as he could that's that's just a dagger to the heart and so a lot of care needs to be taken um with with growers in this regard there's there's deep cultural forces at play the plus has its own story so in the the plus was settled basically in the 1880s and uh, 1890s and and basically by 1910 every acre on the plus that could be plowed was plowed okay and so you know we had a lot of Germans, a lot of Swedes, a lot of Norwegians settle in this area, and, and they brought the knowledge that they had with them, and they did the best that they could. They didn't show up and immediately do this big, you know, biological assay or, you know, all of this research and study to see what crops might might be most regionally appropriate in, in this climate and, and in this land. They didn't have, they were just trying to survive. And, um, and so they they plowed things whether or not a plow was a good thing that's how they knew how to survive they did they they um the the land that was too steep to farm was uh let loose with livestock and it didn't take very long for those lands to be overgrazed and and so we have a lot of star thistle and, and other major weed problems in the canyons on the palouse because of that and so now we're trying to reverse those things we don't certainly blame uh, those early settlers for what they did. Like I said, they did the best with what they had and the information that they had. But now we're starting to learn more and we're starting to reverse those things. But, but, but even from the very beginning, we have these deep cultural traditions of, of how we do things and it's still a constant challenge to overcome them. Then there are of course economic considerations, right? Change is risky. Um, and so we have to minimize risk by ensuring that the changes have an economic sustainability plan. Any farmer, if you're trying to get him to, to, to change his ways in any respect, um, we have to realize that not only are there those deep cultural forces, but you know, part of the reason why they are, are doing the, the, the things that their dad did and their, their grandfather did was because change is risky. It, what, what has been working so far is, is, is going okay now, so, so why change? And so I think that you have to show them that not only is there environmental changes or e environmental considerations, but here's a solid, ec sustainable economic plan going forward that minimizes the risk. You can never minimize risk entirely, but you can help with it. What Shepherd's Grain did in, in this regard was we worked very closely with Washington State University Extension economists to put together a 
a comprehensive cost of production model. It's, it's basically a spreadsheet that our growers fill out every year. Um, they enter in every imaginable cost that it takes to produce a bushel of wheat. And at the bottom of that, it pops out a price per bushel that they need to earn in order to meet their costs. Plus, it gives them a 5% profit margin on top of those because we want them to not only just barely stay in business, but, but be profitable. Um, so everything gets plugged, every imaginable cost gets plugged into the model, um, everything from what farmers ought to be reimbursed for their home office, uh, their health care expenses, all the way up to the big ticket items like seed and fertilizer and labor and, and things like that. And, and the idea behind this was we wanted to allow farmers to be price makers, to set the price of their wheat as opposed to just being price takers okay that's what that's what the commodity markets do is that they they tell farmers what price they're going to get paid and and farmers generally speaking have not had much control over that process we live in a uh, the commodity markets do play an important role when it comes to price discovery but it's largely based on global factors of, of supply and demand and sometimes the, the little guys in Eastern Washington get hurt by this commodity pricing program that is, is more global in scale. So there, there is power in this model as growers band together to make it happen. But, but, but it has to be sold with other values. And that's the environmental sustainability story that accompanies our flour and, and how we sell it. So what do we do with our cost of production model? Well, we, we get it, the, the growers fill it out every year. I accumulate them from, from each of our growers then average them um, all together in a way that makes sense. And we come up with a flat price for the year of what we're gonna pay our growers a bushel of wheat. And, and then the, the price of our flour uh, correspondingly, uh, it, uh, or corresponds to the, the price that we, that we pay um, our grower for a bushel of wheat. What this has the effect of doing is really stabilizing pricing from year to year. Okay, so the commodity market goes up and down, is quite volatile. We've seen that uh, very recently. And, um, but meanwhile, shepherd's grain price just kind of, you know, goes up or down slightly from year to year, but it's not, it's not volatile. And so the customers, the people who buy our flour, appreciate knowing that there's not going to be great volatility when they're managing their financial risks. And our farmers love it. Um, I would say about 60% of the time, our price that we pay to growers is, a, is above the commodity market price. And about 40% of the time, it's, it's below. Um, but they know, what, they, they know what price that they're gonna get for their bushel of wheat. And their bankers love it too, okay? It provides stability and it's a good way to hedge part of their, their production. Um, so of course our our cost of production model still works under the law of supply and demand you know in in the world when we go out and we market our flour we're, we're telling people about the cost of production um and they have to say okay well do we want to support this sort of a model or the model that we, that, that buys flour based on commodity prices the the problem that other supply chains that are have that are trying to establish regenerative supply chains is is having separation from those commodity markets and and this is particularly true with the large companies so think the cargills of the world or the adms or the general mills is that they all want to promote regenerative agriculture but when it comes to pricing what they can pay a grower for a bushel of wheat there's not a lot of flexibility because they are so tied into the commodity markets. They've got every financial transaction hedged um, to ensure that they're not going to lose money in the volatile commodity markets. And, and so they're just bound by that system. So what they've done instead is, is they have tried to work with growers to offer them other services besides an alternative program, program like a cost of production model like Shepherd's Grain or paying them an extra dollar uh, per bushel above a commodity price, um, a cash incentive. So 
what they've come up with are these ecosystem market services. And, and this is, um, well, for an example would be the soil carbon markets. Okay, more and more of these companies are, are trying to line up growers with people who are establishing soil carbon markets so that transitioning to regenerative agriculture, which stores more uh, soil carbon, um, then they can be rewarded financially by, the, by these other, um, by these carbon markets. Um, and I think that there's something to those for sure, but, um, but another example would be field to market or, or agribull. So these are companies um, or organizations that, that allow farmers to enter in data from their own farming practices um, that allow them to be benchmarked um, or scored, for, get a sustainability score or like agribull, uh, you, you enter in all of your information anonymously and it benchmarks you um, compares you to other growers um, in the region that you're farming and, and showing you how you're doing. Um, or there's other third party certifications out there that may or may not be useful in helping establish other markets, niche markets that could be more profitable. And there's nothing wrong in and of themselves with these ecosystem market services, but they are, but, but they're, uh, they're trying to be a substitute for real relationships at the farm level through the supply chain. Okay, they're, they're based largely on modeling um, and they're connected to other interests that may or may not have the farmer's best interest in mind. So one, one large company who I'll leave nameless was really trying to get growers to sign up for uh, the field to market program. And if they can get the growers to sign up to the, the, the farm to market program, they can use that in, in some sort of a mass balance way to achieve their own sustainability goals or to sign up with Agribull, which is a, kind of a similar program, but that's actually owned by Nutrien, the, the world's largest um, farm input provider. So, um, and, and not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but, um, but, but it, it's not just a, a very simple on the face thing. It, it, it's a substitute for just having real and transparent relationships with the growers on their level and seeing what they're actually doing on their farms. So what have we learned? Um, Shepherd's Grain has learned that offering a value to growers that hits them at the heart can overcome systemic cultural hurdles that, that are not good for the environment. So how can you get farmers to transition? Well, maybe go to them and say, you know what, we're starting a program for, guy, for guys who, are, who have adopted regenerative practices to really connect them to the marketplace. Okay, most of these growers out there, they, they baby their crop along all year, pouring their money, sweat, tears into, into seeing their crop makes it to harvest. And then at harvest time, they roll through with the combine, take it to the grain elevator and, you know, just kiss, kiss that crop goodbye. It goes into the pit and they have no connection to where it's going. Well, this is this is really a value that that farmers um, uh, treasure greatly. Uh, just having that reconnection between the grower and the consumer is hugely fulfilling. It it meets it it touches them at the heart level. Separation from the commodity markets allows us to provide an economically sustainable pricing model that provides pricing stability to growers and and users. Um, and our growers. Um, they don't mind when our price is below the commodity price, okay? They, they always like it to be above, but they don't mind when it's below because they know the long-term benefits of just being in this stable pricing pattern when they're marketing their wheat. Shepherd's Grain is at the forefront of developing um, a very robust and accurate soil carbon market, but other ecosystem marketplace services seem to meet up be hollow compared to the shepherd's grain program that just has full transparency from the farm level through the supply chain all the way to the customers and and farmers that i deal with they just don't find great value in in benchmarking themselves based on modeling or getting some um, sustainability score based on models um, there's just not a lot of value there um, Willingness to separate from the commodity markets and paying growers a premium price, like like uh, the model that's used in in organic marketing, which is just it's it's basically supply and demand driven. But there's there's a recognized premium that comes with growing 
crops organically, or a commodity-based price pl plus cash premium, or coming up with an alternative pricing mechanism like shepherd's grain cost of production model it is going to be necessary, okay? So aim for the heart, but don't forget about the pocketbook, okay? Farmers want to know how, um, how them adopting regenerative practices is going to lead to more profitability besides just the economic benefits on farm of you know that come from having increased soil organic matter or whatever um so technology all the modeling is is very valuable but but you don't win farmers solely with that so thank you very much there's my contact information and happy to answer any questions thank you jerby for the talk and telling us about how farmers can adopt the regenerative practices and that can be incentivized to help them to look forward to those practices. Uh, with that, I wanted to welcome Dr. Chris Benedict, who is the last speaker of this session. And he's an extension specialist at Washington State University, and he will be discussing his ongoing effects at the Washington State University to develop a statewide soil health roadmap. Welcome to SoilCon 2021. My name is Chris Benedict. I work for Washington State University. And today I'm gonna to talk about the Washington State Soil Health Roadmap process and some of the preliminary findings. I am speaking on behalf of many other team members at WSU that have contributed to the Soil Health Roadmap process. In 2019, efforts began to create a coordinated statewide soil health initiative across three different agencies, the Washington Conservation Commission, the Washington State Department of Agriculture and Washington State University. Each agency takes a lead role in various aspects of research, outreach, and policy. The vision of the initiative was a coordinated effort to develop new soil health information from geographically representative, relevant, long-term agroecological research and extension sites that would be spread throughout the state with a focus on soil health, as you can see in this map then to disseminate this information through demonstration sites and outreach activities, increase adoption through incentive programs and policy, and monitor statewide progress through a variety of means. Initially, state proviso funds funded a portion of WSU's outline Soil Health Initiative Plan required to support efforts of three basic elements. One was to create the initiative within the university. Two, was to support efforts to outline a roadmap for the state of Washington, and lastly, was to initiate a long-term soil health research and extension site, or LTER, in Northwestern Washington. Full funding for WSU's portion of the initiative was to be signed by the governor, but because of uncertainties of COVID-19, in April 2020, the funding was not secured. This talk will focus on the second element and discuss the roadmap process and preliminary findings. To simplify the roadmap process, the state was broken into 10 major focus areas that included the irrigated Columbia Basin rotations with an additional inclusion of the potato production as a major focus area, dryland agriculture, which is spread throughout much of Eastern Washington, juice and wine grapes, which really is dominated in central and south, southeastern Washington, annual Northwestern Washington production systems, which largely represent a three county region in Northwestern Washington, tree fruit, which is broken up in the central part of the state, Western Washington diversified production systems, and input from the environmental constituency. Feedback was acquired from representatives from the major focus areas and the generated information is currently going through a distillation process into themes and ideas. These will be aggregated to outline current common themes across uh, of current issues and ways to improve soil health across the state in the near and distant future. I'm going to give you a preview into some of these themes and ideas that surfaced. Shown in this diagram is the roadmap process that has occurred to date and is planned to occur going forward. We began by identifying critical focus areas, identified key stakeholders in each of these areas, 
and where needed acquired input from these stakeholders. This largely occurred in most cases. The raw information was then extracted and compiled into themes. These themes will then be shared back with the Soil Health Initiative leadership and advisory groups, along with review from external partners. This feedback will then be incorporated. The final document will be, be provided to lawmakers as part of the reporting process. These findings will be used to inform LTER activities, the initiative resource allocation, policy development, and research priorities, particularly at WSU. One key element here is that this is a living document that will need to be updated as new information is identified, resources are allocated, and as milestones and goals are achieved. Let's start by looking at the environmental constituent focus area that represents a diverse group of governmental and non-governmental entities. We held an online listening session with key representatives from across the state. Some of the key themes that came up is, is that soil health is really tied in with overall resiliency. This can include climate, economic, and food resiliency. There's a need for a long-term funding for soil health implementation across all areas. And there's definitely a need for more research on soil health practices and that this information needs to be made readily available. Next is, is that there needs to be a mechanism to verify these soil health practices. Over the course of this, this last week, we've heard from many speakers who have talked about soil health assessments, and the idea was to bring them in and discuss these for, for, to have impact in this particular area. Next was to pay landowners for soil health practices that have tangible outcomes, such as carbon sequestration. And lastly, that soil health issues can bring together the environmental community with the farming community. 99% of juice and wine grape production occurs in Eastern Washington, as is outlined in this map of the state's AVA regions. So most of the feedback that we acquired, which was directly from grape growers and also from existing resources, came from the South and Central regions. Some key themes that came up is, is that there is a distinct soil health need between soil juice and wine grape growers um, because there are uh, intrinsically different production needs there as well. Secondly, is that improved soil health to help with nutrient uptake and reduce soil borne pests. Next is, is that there's a difficulty in obtaining certain soil health practices, and this is largely associated with perennial crop and longevity of plantings. Additionally, research is needed in rootstock cyan combinations in various climates and soils. And then lastly, there needs to be an investment in a soil scientist at WSU dedicated to working in this production system. The uh, irrigated Columbia Basin represents about 700,000 acres of farmland and is located in the central part of Washington. It, with over 70 different crops, many of which are high value, um, in, that include tree fruit, forage crops, vegetables, grains, and a number of different cattle and dairy operations also exist within the basin. An electronic survey was distributed to seek input that resulted in feedback from a diverse group that included both producers and consultants. Some key themes that, that came out of this included that there are largely issues around wind erosion, water supply with low soil water holding capacity, soil tilth, and soil borne diseases are common. Examples of challenges to adopting soil health improving practices include cost, logistics affiliated with these practices, short term land lease, and low crop residue. And the feedback that focused on research and information needs largely focused on strategies to improve soil health the economics of these soil health practices, and then the tangible benefits of, these, of, the, of soil health. Now let's switch to Western Washington and particularly look at Northwestern Washington cropping systems. This focus area contains a number of unique high value crops, such as fresh market potatoes, vegetable seed crops, and short term pastures. A listening session was held with both producers and consultants from this area. Tendi stated that healthy soils relate to an innate feeling, that the entire growing process is easier, requires fewer irrigation events, 
and results in higher yields and yield quality. Current issues mentioned by attendees largely focus on soil physical properties such as soil compaction, lack of soil structure, but also the inability to let land rest or an economically viable alternative rotational crop to fresh market potatoes. Soil pH was also discussed as it relates to the current crops grown in rotations and development pressure from adjacent urban centers. Research priorities covered a wide range of topics, but some examples include benefits of lengthening crop rotation, what aspects of virgin soils lead, leads to higher yields, how to optimize cover crop management, the need for a better understanding of soil biology, and how to improve water, namely irrigation management, via healthier soils. Several barriers to adoption to improve soil health were also mentioned that included plant pathogens via cover crops, production economics, limit longer rotations, complexities associated with alternative tillage strategies, and several challenges associated with the use of organic amendments. To overcome these barriers, attendees mentioned the need for financial incentives as soil health is a public resource. These could take several different forms, such as the valuation of economic benefits of management practices to build soil health, two, to include stewardship requirements and leases in other contracts, and three, direct payments for certain management practices to help producers overcome constraints of tight profit margins. And the attendees mentioned that the core investments really should focus on impacts on soil health, on envir environmental services, and specific management practices on soil health. Washington is known for its apple production, but many other fruits are grown that include pears and cherries. Production is located on the eastern foothills of the Cascades into the south central region. Feedback for this focus area occurred through in-person, online surveys, and focus groups. Some key themes that, that arose included complexity associated with perennial production in terms of making changes to soil, soil health is not well understood by the industry, and that soil health is related to tree health and includes yield and yield quality, and that there are several challenges with soil types common in this production zone. There's a lack of knowledge related to soil complexity, especially as it relates to soil biology, there's a diverse research needs. Examples include replant disease, soil health analysis with simple action steps, or use of non-synthetic and microbial inputs or ways to conserve water. And lastly, some short-term milestones include increased awareness of soil health, use of refined soil health test indicators, and standard operating procedures for soil health. Western Washington has a highly diversified set of production systems and growing regions. This focus area concentrated on diversified production systems that typically sell direct to consumers, commonly follow organically approved practices, and can integrate livestock with crops. A listening session was held online over the course of several days with 16 farms in, that represented nine different counties. Some key themes that, that surfaced include interest in tangible, such things as nutrients, but also in less tangible, such as carbon sequestration, aspects of soil health. And the group really self-described as stewards of the land. Some of the challenges mentioned include land use changes, such as urbanization, complexity of diversified, diverse systems, limited resources to experiment with soil health practices, Next, the necessity of tillage for soil preparation and weed suppression, soil fertility, soilborne pathogens, and flooding in lowlands that is common in this region. The group did mention information needs in particular to carbon sequestration and building soil organic matter, soil biology, organic reduced tillage, and cover crops. Some of the barriers to adoption of soil health practices include erosion of public funding for WSU extension, limited resources such as mine, money, time, and effort for innovation, and the need for direct technical assistance, education, and funding is all needed. First, I want to point out that 
we did not include the dry land or the potato production focus areas because we were still in the information acquisition phase for those two focus areas. Let's talk about some overall key themes. First is the lack of information to translate the current state of soil health knowledge into practical agronomic decisions. This was commonly reported by attendees across all focus areas. Secondly, the value of soil health varies across production systems. This underscores a need for a diverse yet integrated approach. Third is a better understanding of soil biology. This is particularly noted in the perennial production systems. And lastly, is that resources are need to be made available for farmers to try soil health practices on their own farm. Thank you, Chris, for giving such an outstanding talk and then telling us about how to prioritize the research and then moving forward with that. So moving forward with the, our session, we got a lot much questions and then so much of enthusiasm. And I'll go one by one to each of these questions directed towards our speakers. And uh, first, I will ask Dr. Bill Pan uh, the series of questions which came and let me get them and so we will go one by one. <clears throat> so the first question is from Craig and he asked, how does the level of organic matter in the soil relates to the silica levels and the crusting? Uh, hi, Craig. Um, so while we did not include uh, organic matter as a, a secondary a variable in that st study that I showed, uh, we do know, of course, um, that while organic matter um, additions separate from those crop residues that contain the silica would not uh, uh, impact the, the silica cycling directly, the organic matter would uh, have a, sec a second effect on compaction through its uh, effects on soil aggregation. And so um, in the um, pulp and co-product uh, study that I showed you, we, we did uh, show improvements in soil aggregation with the addition of lignin-rich um, byproduct from the straw. And um, we could, we, I didn't have time to show uh, some additional results where we actually saw um, increased fungal hyphae growing in those soils that were amended with that lignin rich co-product. So um, more hyphal, fungal hyphal development, uh, uh, greater aggregation, and that's going to increase the uh, macropores of the soil and hopefully would have a beneficial effect on uh, reducing uh, the, the surface soil crusting compaction that we, we often see with raindrop impact. Thank you, Bill, for the answer. And the next question is for Jeremy. Is every farmer you work with a man? I notice you are referring to every farmer as he or him and being influenced by their grandfather and fathers. This question is from Kate, by the way. Yeah, good question, Kate. I would say yes. I, I think that uh, of all of the farms that we work with, the, the business side of things and the practice side of things is largely um, driven by, by the men. And so that's why I refer to them as, as guys maybe a couple of times there, but certainly in most cases as well, their wives are very much involved on the farming operation. And, um, and, and I think just generally speaking, in the U.S. today, I, I think women are, uh, are, are an increasing percentage of overall farm management. Um, I'm seeing those stats. And so yeah, as far as being influenced by their father and grandfather, yes, when you talk to a lot of these farmers that we work with and, and they are speaking historically, they often use that, that language um, as well. Thank you, Jeremy, for the answer. And next question is for Bill uh, from Darian. 
And he asked, any information on using camelina instead of canola? Because it is also a seed or oil crop in brassica family, and seeds are more available to a small scale grower. Yeah, uh, so actually during the early stages of our um, Washington Biofuels Cropping Systems Project, um, we invested um, some funding into looking into camelina as well as oil seeds and, and some cellulosic crops. And uh, Scott, Scott Holbert was involved in uh, doing some genetics and breeding of that particular crop. And at that time, um, back in the 2008 through 12 period, um, there was quite a interest in camelina and it was being sold as a, a, a crop that could be grown on marginal lands. It was being sold as a crop that was um, relatively a non-food crop. And so people were interested in that because they didn't want to get caught up in all the controversy of food versus fuel crops. Um, but I, I'll tell you, and, and so we had a lot of discussions with the aviation industry. I think just recently they, they flew a plane with Camelina um, jet fuel. Um, and, and they really wanted to focus on non-food crops because they didn't want to get involved with that, that controversy over food versus fuel. But uh, from my perspective and, and thinking about the perspective from the growers, I always thought that uh, pushing forward on crops like canola that were, could be food or fuel uh, was beneficial for the, the farmers because they would have that uh, back, they would have that market that they could uh, turn towards if the fuel market collapsed or didn't work out for whatever reason, they wouldn't be stuck holding a lot of grain that they couldn't sell, sell uh, if they were focused on a fuel only crop. Uh, of course, camelina can be made, um, can be used for um, cooking oil and, and there is a small industry in Eastern Washington uh, promoting that as well. That's a great point and thank you for the answer. And next question is from Jennifer for Jeremy. And she asked, do you ever find that inputs can be reduced so that even if the prices, they get below the commodity price that they can make a larger profit? Yes, and that is that very good question. So, um, you know, our, our, our farmer here in the Pacific Northwest, they, they love our cost of production pricing model uh, because it provides stability for them. But, but actually, as I've talked to other farmers around the country who have embraced um, soil health practices on their farms, um, they, they, they're kind of scared by the cost of production model because after they've been in it for you know, 10 or, or 15 years and, the, and they're seeing very great benefits from increased soil organic matter or um, increased water holding capacity of their soils, yeah, they're they're and and less inputs because of those things. Um, they're seeing that their cost of production is really really low, and they don't mind the commodity prices at all. They're they're making a good profit either way. So um, that is a good point by Jennifer. Next question is for Bill from Carol. And she asked, would you speak to the role of soil health and soil carbon in potentially migrate, uh, mitigating the extreme hydrological weather events that could be problematic in the recent years and often attributed to the climate change? Okay, well, that's kind of a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> uh, in terms of extremes of weather, of course, we get all, all sides of the extremes. And, uh, but the nice thing about uh, studying Eastern Washington dryland agriculture is we have a really nice gradient of precipitation. Um, and, and the uh, uh, cropping systems have adopted 
uh, adapted to to those different uh, microclimates. And so uh, there's really a system that's been well adapted for dry. There's a, a from dry to wet and everything in between. Uh, in terms of organic matter playing a, in a, an important role, of course, as, as uh, I mentioned and several others have mentioned throughout this uh, webinar series that uh, uh, organic matter can in influence water holding capacity um, just on a, on a unit um, of, of soil, but also um, if you can get enough aggregation uh, working and, and increase the, the size of the macropores, then you can also influence water infiltration. Uh, so you can influence uh, infiltration and storage capacity. Uh, two key things for reducing runoff. And then in terms of just organic matter management, in terms of straw management, uh, we've known for a long time, and, and actually Dave Huggins worked on this for his PhD thesis, that uh, improving standing straw or increasing standing straw will simply trap more snow. And so uh, trapping more snow, keeping it in place on the landscape rather than letting the snow uh, all blow off to one section of the field, very important for uh, achieving better water balance throughout the field landscape. So uh, there's, there's a lot of factors that go, that go into that um, equation. Thanks for the answer. And before moving to the next question, I would like to remind everybody that, that there might be a poll popping up in, on your screen about your experience uh, for this uh, Soil Con 2021 and how the overall experience with the website. So please do fill that and give us the feedback. And moving on the next question from Carol uh, for Jeremy, how do the farmers you work with value the soil health as a capital investment in their, their land? Yeah, good. Another question. I, I would say that that's sort of an evolving discussion. Um, certainly they are, you know, trying to increase soil carbon, soil organic matter um, for just for agronomic reasons and, and productivity. But it, it certainly, um, if, if you are increasing soil carbon, that is a, um, there, there's a financial component to that. And I, I, I don't know, but I don't think that land values are, are greatly based upon how land is being managed and how, let's just say, soil organic matter is, is increasing. I would think that land values should increase if if a farmer has been managing it in a way where it's increasing soil organic matter. Um, and, and I think connected to this would be Carol's next question, if I can just dive in, is could you also speak to how that is different with leased land? And if you've heard any good solutions to any disparity. And I would say we've done some thinking in that regard um, in how we can educate landowners to realize this as well. Because if, if, if they realize the value of their land could go up based upon how it is managed in, in farming practices, they may be more picky about who they're going to lease their land to. And, and I think that landowners should, I, I think that we do need more targeted educational efforts to, to landlords in that respect. And next question is for Bill from Ernesto. And he asked how, the, how to measure the efficiency or impact of human humic based soil amendment to improve in the soil, uh, improvers in the soil. Sorry about that. Uh, how to measure uh, the effect of adding humic acids? Yeah, and then any kind of improvers in the soil. Okay. Um, well, uh, so there have been a lot of talk about different uh, measurements of carbon in soil. Um, you might have noticed in that biosolids project, we made one attempt to measure uh, stable versus more labile carbon by uh, measuring acid, um, acid resistant versus acid uh, solubilizable carbon. Um, 
you know, and, and there's a lot more detailed work on, on humic acids that you can do uh, using sophisticated equipment, uh, NMR uh, type uh, measurements to, to actually look at the actual biochemical structures. Um, so it, it gets pretty detailed and there's really a whole society that just looks at humic acids and humic, humic substances. So it gets pretty complex. Um, you know, from a fertility standpoint, I'm always interested in the effects of uh, humic acids uh, and related substances on their ability to uh, chelate micronutrients and keep keeping them more soluble. So that, that could be one measure of whether you're having any beneficial effects on soil fertility is whether or not you're, you can improve, uh, say, micronutrient uptake measured in the plants. Uh, with the use of humic substances. So that would be one indirect measure that I could think of. Okay, thank you for your answer. And the next question is again for Jeremy from Jennifer. And she asked uh, that Schiffer grain model seems great for community systems. And do you have any thoughts about how your approach could be used in less standardized systems like in vegetables? Um, sorry, for some reason I, kind of got cut out there. Give me one ah. second to read this question. Okay, I'll repeat the question about, it is about, do you have any thoughts about how your approaches could be used in a less standardized systems, for example, vegetable crops? Yeah, that uh, good question. I, I really hadn't thought about it. Um, you know, like I said earlier that the, the cost of production model that we use uh, works well for growers in the Pacific Northwest. And it's not, I don't think that it's necessarily a, a universal solution. It's, it's, not a, it's not a perfect model for all cases. But I, but I do think that the, the main point that I was trying to make is that um, the more that people can separate themselves from the commodity markets, more opportunities are, are going to open up. And I think that, um, you know, with what I see going on, I, I see a growing movement of more decentralization of food production. Uh, I think that this last year in particular spurred a lot of that on where people are looking to more local um, solutions for where to source their food. And, and as that happens, as we become less decentralized in food production, I think that we're going to see all sorts of different pricing models that fit appropriately for whatever crop production um, is, is, is happening. Uh, adding to that, I have one question from myself, like considering the vegetable crops already are very like on the expensive side of produce, what you can buy in the market if they're organic, like, so if they will be, if the growers will be adopting uh, the uh, cultural practices, what you are suggesting, do you think it will increase their prices in such a range that not many people can go for them? No, I, I don't think that that's, that's necessarily the case. I mean, any farmer has to, in, in, to stay in business, you have to meet your costs of production. Okay. So, um, what, what the, so you're always going to be selling your, your produce, your vegetables at the price that it costs to to grow them, plus you want a profit margin in there as well. And so I think that it's it's trying to understand uh, who who is going to be most competitive in the marketplace with that with that profit margin, or who can produce the food at a at a less expensive rate. And and those people are probably going to be um, most successful. But again, that's where you have all of these value concepts that enter into the equation. So. If you go to the farmer's market and you can buy broccoli from, that's grown in a conventional uh, system, it, it may be less expensive than uh, the organic producer that's selling broccoli. And so it just, it's a lot of values that are attached to these things and, and the supply and demand, not just of the, of the food product itself, but of the values that are demanded by consumers. Thank you. And I guess we have only one minute left in the session, but there is the last question which I, which I wanted to quickly ask uh, from Patrick. In the Pacific Northwest, is there any value in selectively applying micronutrients 
for example, zinc, iron, boron, magnesium, etc., for our principal crop farm farmlands. And I think it's targeted towards Bill. Okay. Well, certainly across the vast uh, array of cropping systems that that Chris outlined for the state of Washington, there there certainly is a uh, role role to play for micronutrients uh, in various cropping systems. And, and that, those can be indicated by just uh, visual uh, deficiency symptoms of the tissues to tissue plant testing uh, indicators. Um, and, and micronutrients are, are used more so in the higher value crops uh, maybe because uh, th th those growers can afford to to invest in micronutrients more than than the uh, grain producers, but uh, also they're they're faced with uh, some uh, interesting soil chemical challenges that relate to micronutrient availability, like uh, uh, pH affected uh, decreases in in uh, chemical availability. Um, so yeah, there's a broad uh, spectrum of, of uh, needs there that have been defined. Um, and I would say that, um, you know, folks that, that think they have a micronutrient deficiency, try adding micronutrients uh, in their soil. Uh, It looks like Bill, Bill froze. Uh, but don't see a response that day. Oh, he's back. Uh, frozen. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so just, yeah, I, I think there are cases where uh, even though micronutrient responses are not obtained doesn't mean that they're deficient. It might just mean that the uh, there's an ineffective fertilizer form or placement or timing. Thank you. And with that, uh, I wanted to thank all of our session uh, attendees for coming in such a large uh, quantity and then giving questions for making this session very interactive. I thank to all of our speakers. And with that, I conclude the SOLCON 2021.